Okay, well, I'd just like to get the proceedings started here. My name's James Murphy, and I teach in the government department here at Dartmouth College. I have a special interest in ancient and medieval political philosophy, which is germane to our lecture today. It's my great pleasure and privilege to welcome Kenneth Pennington to the Dartmouth campus. And Professor Pennington will be delivering the Roger S. Aaron lecture for 2007, uh, a lectureship that has included some of Ken's friends in the past, uh, such as Brian Tierney and uh, John Noonan. Uh, so uh, we have sort of a tradition of eminent legal historians in this particular lecture series. Uh, professor Pennington is now the Kelly Quinn Professor of Ecclesiastical and Legal History at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. Before that, he taught for about 30 years at Syracuse University, where he taught medieval intellectual history. His PhD is from Cornell University, uh, and his interests range from medieval and early modern politics, political theory, constitutional thought, church history, and of course, uh, legal history more properly. Um, Professor Pennington has published many books and articles um, in the area of legal and political theory and history of legal and political theory, the medieval and early modern period. Um, and as I've just discovered, he's had a long-standing interest in the topic of torture. And many of us uh, thought that that topic was uh, relegated to the past, uh, but recent events, political events since uh, the September 11th attacks have brought torture very much back into the public forum and to much widespread attention. And so it's, it's wonderfully valuable to have a scholar like Professor Pennington who's been thinking about torture and studying the history of torture for a long time to offer his perspective on this now current topic. Um, so um, let me just say something about uh, that Professor Pennington is um, well known in part because he's a protege of, uh, of, uh, of a great eminent uh, legal historian, S Stefan Kuttner, uh, perhaps the preeminent historian of the, the canon law in the 20th century. And so Ken comes uh, very well recommended and trained indeed. So thank you very much, Ken, for coming. Thank you very much, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'd like to thank the uh, people at the Rockefeller Center for making a, uh, uh, my trip here and my stay here uh, just marvelous. And I'd like to thank all of you for showing up. I noticed, or I was told anyway, that up until about uh, a week ago, there was snow on the ground in Hanover, New Hampshire. Well, there isn't snow on the ground in Hanover, New Hampshire right now, as I saw as we walked to the Rockefeller Center. Uh, the quad looks filled with, uh, well, just filled. <laughs> uh, I suppose the first thing I should do in talking about torture, which is, a, as Jim alluded to, a political issue as well as an issue of jurisprudence, is to tell you where I stand on torture. And uh, that way you won't have to spend the lecture trying to figure out where I stand on torture. When it comes to torture, I'm an absolutist. That is, I'm absolutely against torture. I think that by the end of the lecture, you'll have some idea of why I feel that torture does not belong in our, uh, in our legal system or in our government, and certainly not a part of our judicial procedure. The other thing that I've scribbled away at for the last 30 years and had a great interest in is the issue of due process. And I won't get into the due process in great detail today, but it, we are going to bump up against due process and the idea of due process every once in a while. And I would make the point, the rather simple point, that due process is also connected with torture, depending on whether you're an absolutist in your belief about uh, the right of other human beings 
to enjoy their full rights of due process, absolutely, as I do, then there are certain ramifications to taking that particular position. Not political ramifications, but jurisprudential ramifications. The last point that I would make is when I lecture, I like to, in a sense, put my footnotes up on the screen. And so um, I ask you while you're listening to me to please read what's on the screen, because I'm not necessarily going to repeat what is on the screen, but it's information that I think is very important for understanding or following what I am going to say. The first point that I would make about torture is it's been around for a long time. Uh, we have been torturing people uh, for as long as there have been human beings. We haven't been shy about subjecting other human beings to the indignities and the pain and suffering of being tortured. The, uh, the other point that I would make right at the beginning is that a definition of torture. And the definition of torture that I would like to use today is the definition of torture that is a procedure that is part of judicial procedure which is approved by the state. Uh, in former times, it was approved by the prince or the judge or the lord. But uh, in terms of modern affairs, it is something which, it is an act, it is a procedure which is approved by the state. I think that uh, Ed Peters' definition of torture as a, as a just a very general definition of torture, and we're going to talk about definitions of torture, particularly at the end of the lecture, modern definitions of torture, but I think his definition of torture, torture is something that public authority does or condones, I think that's important. Other, we do torture people in other ways. We have, uh, we have rogue torturers who are not torturing with the authority of the state, and these people are committing criminal acts. But what we're going to be talking about today is torture, for the most part, that can be justified and was justified by jurists for centuries. And the last preliminary point that uh, I would like to make is that torture has been around for centuries. Torture has suddenly reappeared, um, as, um, as Jeremy Waldron points out in a splendid, absolutely splendid article in the Columbia Law Review that Torture was considered in 1911 to be something of the past. Uh, the, the, the author who wrote the encyclopedia article of 1911 was, was just a, a little bit optimistic about torture having disappeared because rogue torture existed in Europe um, in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. That is to say, if you know anything about the history of Algeria, if you know something about the history of South America, if you know something about the history of Western Europe, uh, there has been torture that was committed, not necessarily with the approval of governments, but it was torture which was um, committed by people who thought they were defending the state. Uh, one other thing that I would add that we'll get back to later is that torture is very often justified in the minds of people by the idea that the people who are being tortured are so heinous and their acts are so hideous that this justifies torturing them. I think you'll probably resonate with uh, with that idea because we have, um, since 9-11, <coughs> I think the approach of the American government has also been um, framed by that idea. The Greeks are wonderful. <laughs> we all agree that the Greeks are wonderful. 
but the, uh, the Greeks had uh, at least two faults. One fault was that they tortured people, and they tortured people as part of their uh, judicial system, so that uh, at least in recorded human history, we can trace torture back to the Greeks. The, uh, the second fault that the Greeks had was that they weren't very good lawyers. They were magnificent philosophers. They were splendid artists. But they weren't very good jurists. And so we know very, very little about Greek torture. And one of the reasons that we know very, very little about Greek torture is that almost all the evidence that we have about the way in which Greeks tortured people as part of their judicial process comes from literary records. And the, the uh, short segment that I'm showing you from Aristophanes' Frogs is an illustration of this. How can we interpret this particular text? We could interpret it that it is a, uh, an example of the variety of tortures that the Greeks used, and the Greeks used, as far as we can tell, and it's relatively uncertain, the Greeks used torture in both criminal cases and civil cases. That's very unusual, by the way. Normally, civil offenses do not fall under the auspices of torture. But the Greeks seem to have tortured in civil cases, and they also um, tortured in, in criminal cases, which is the norm in most systems of jurisprudence. I love the last line, by the way, uh, where he says, but, but not with this. Don't torture him with this. And if you remember the frogs, uh, the, uh, the storyline is that the slave becomes the lord, and the lord becomes the slave. And so when uh, Xanthius is telling him to torture, he's actually, the slave is telling the person to torture his lord. And so when he says to him, but, but not with a soft-leaved onion or a tender leek, this is, I think, sort of the Br'er Rabbit approach to uh, argumentation that he, we really can't probably take this seriously. <clears throat> if the Greeks weren't great jurists, and they left us almost no jurisprudence, you will, if you read a book on Greek law, one of the things that you notice, first of all, is that there's almost no Greek jurisprudence. The Romans were magnificent jurists. They weren't necessarily great philosophers, but they were, uh, they were magnificent jurists. And they wrote a lot about torture, and they thought a lot about torture. The Romans basically decided, and this is over the course of about four or five centuries, the Romans basically decided that slaves should be tortured, or could be tortured, under certain circumstances, and that they should only be tortured for criminal offenses. And then in the later Roman Empire, they also decided that uh, Romans could be tortured, but only for the most hideous, heinous crimes. Treason was the crime that they very often thought was hideous enough. Treason against the emperor was hideous enough that torture could be employed. And you'll notice that they immediately, from the very beginning, and you'll notice I put the dates of the Roman Juris Labio in this particular text. And the reason that I did this is already by the first century BC, even in the case of slaves, which were technically property, with which a Roman slave owner in the first century BC could do almost anything he wished, or she wished, with slaves because they were property, even in the case of slaves when it came to torture, they put limitations on the amount of torture to which a slave could be subjected. And there was an entire section of Roman law which was devoted to the question of torture. In Latin, torture was a very peculiar word. It was questia. That is to say, 
question. If you were going to torture someone, the term that was used, legally speaking, was questio, as this, the first word in this text indicates. Um, <coughs> and from the very beginning, and this text from the Roman jurist Ulpian illustrates this. This is from the third century, the middle of the third century AD. From the middle of the third century AD, the Romans were very dubious about torture, and they were particularly dubious about the efficacy of torture. Was torture, was torture valid? Was torture something that really worked? It's very interesting to me that my friend Jeremy Waldron, whose picture I showed you just a few moments ago, he believes, even though he's completely opposed, absolutely opposed as I am, to the idea of torturing people, he believes that torture works. We'll get back to that idea uh, later in the lecture. But uh, it would be interesting. I'm not going to ask you a, a show of hands, but how many of you actually believe? Don't raise your hands. But how many of you actually believe torture work, just works? Think about that uh, um, for the next 30 or 40 minutes. Is this something that really is efficacious in getting at the truth? And Christians. Again, I'm just going to use one text to anecdotally illustrate this. But very early on, Christians also were very dubious about torture. And the text I'm showing you is from St. Augustine's De Civitate Dei, The City of God. And the point that St. Augustine makes in this text, and it was a point that other Christian church fathers had already made prior to St. Augustine, is that if you torture someone, not only is, an of, it, is it offen an offense against divine law, or the Latin term is fos, um, you'll notice that the contrary to divine law is nefas. <laughs> fos is divine law, nefas is um, contrary to divine law. Not only is torture contrary to divine law, but Augustine raises a point that is going to get raised again and again for the next 1,200 years. And that is that if you torture someone, you might be torturing an innocent person. Because how can you possibly know whether a person is guilty or not? And that violates a fundamental principle. A person is innocent until proven guilty. And Augustine, as far as I know, is the first person to raise this particular point in conjunction with torture. Now, I have to say a few words about a procedural revolution which takes place in the 12th century. <clears throat> but before I do, I want to talk again just very briefly and schematically about a great legal revival that takes place in the 11th and early 12th centuries. The great legal revival was the rediscovery of Roman law. Those Roman law texts that I just showed you, they weren't just texts that remained buried in ancient Roman law. At the end of the 11th, the beginning of the 12th century, law schools were established in northern Italy at a place called Bologna. And in these law schools, they began to teach Roman law. And those texts that I showed you and the other texts that the Roman jurists uh, wrote about torture. I indicated the Romans spilled a lot of ink about torture, and they did a lot of thinking about torture. What I showed you were just two texts that were characteristic of their thought. But those texts were read by students and expounded by professors for century after century after century until Roman law was no longer the primary 
books that were studied by every single law student in Europe, and this occurred sometime between roughly 1650 and 1750, depending on which part of Europe you're talking about. So those, the first point I would make is the Romans thought about torture was not just ancient knowledge. It was, in a sense, by the 13th, 14th, or 15th centuries, this was, this was living law. This was the material, the law books that students were studying, every single student was studying, so that these ideas about torture were very much alive at the beginning of the European legal tradition, which begins at the end of the 11th and the beginning of the 12th century with the revival of first Roman law and then the study of ecclesiastical law and the establishment of the first law schools in Europe, which occurs at the beginning of the 12th century. Some people say at the end of the 11th century, but certainly by the beginning of the 12th century, we begin to have the study of law, the academic study of law, and we begin to have students studying law. <coughs> I went too far forward. Is this the way we go back? No. <laughs> um, Judy, help me. <laughs> I am not accustomed to a Mac environment, I'm afraid. <laughs> In any case, I'll continue. If you remember what was on the uh, screen that I was showing you. By the way, if you're interested in some of these texts, I have this entire lecture on my website. So if you go to my website and look at my homepage, you'll be able to review these texts if, uh, if you wish. But the other point that I wanted to make about the uh, revolution in the 12th century, the first was the revival of law. The second is the fact that there was a procedural revolution in law as well. Up until the 12th century, the modes of proof in European courts were various, but the modes of proof did not, for the most part, rely on written and oral evidence presented to a judge in a way which would be familiar to us today if we were being transported back into a 12th or 13th century courtroom. The uh, Germanic mode of proof that was very often used, particularly in Northern Europe, was the ordeal. The ordeal was a, a judgment, a mode of proof in which God decided who was guilt, who was guilty, and who was innocent. Uh, one of the most uh, popular ordeals was the ordeal of the hot iron. And in this, a bar of iron was heated until it was hot. It was blessed by a priest. There was a liturgical ceremony around it. The church and the priest was very important for the conducting of an ordeal. And the person who was being accused of a crime would then have to lift that red hot iron. And depending on the crime of which the person was accused, they would then have to carry that red-hot iron. Usually the ceremony would take place within, in front of the west portal of the church. And as the villagers gathered around, this must have been a wonderful public ceremony, and as the sweet smell of burning human flesh wafted through the church, this is what it was. Uh, this is, I'm not going to do that again, Judy. <laughs> um, the priest would then bind the hands of the person and after three days, the bandages would be unbound. And depending on whether there was, the wounds were festering, wounds there would be, but whether the wounds were oozing or were infected, 
this would decide on whether the person was guilty or innocent. If the wounds were healing cleanly, the person was innocent. If the wounds were not healing cleanly, the person was guilty. The point is, however, and the reason that for about five or six centuries, this particular mode of proof was so widespread in Europe was that it had one great advantage. There was no human judge. Evidence was not particularly important. And it was God who determined the guilt and innocence of the party. And the great advantage of God's deciding, rather than a human judge, particularly in a, in a rural society, was that you couldn't get mad at God. God, if he made a decision, was not someone against whom you could have a vendetta or whom you could shoot. And so this mode of proof, which may seem irrational to us, was a mode of proof which seemed for centuries very rational to and very useful in human society. This began to change in the 12th century. And during the course of the 12th century, a new procedure was introduced, which was based on Roman law. And if you remember, the revival of Roman law takes place at the 11th, uh, end of the 11th, the beginning of the 12th century. Well, during the course of the 12th century, the accusatorial procedure began to supplant the ordeal, particularly in southern Europe, but also in northern Europe as well. And during the course of the 12th century in southern Europe, it almost completely supplanted the ordeal. And the accusatorial procedure was one in which an accuser would come forward, would accuse you of a crime, would have to present evidence in court before a human judge to justify his or her accusation. And then a determination was made in the court based on the new Roman rules of procedure that jurists were learning from the revival of Roman law, the rules of evidence and the rules of procedure taken from Roman law would then decide the guilt and innocence of a person. Now, I said accusatorial because this was a very important element. There had to be an accuser. Their sense of justice was such that the state could not make an accusation. In fact, there was no state, so the state could not make an accusation. There, was, there were no district attorneys. There, were no, there was no police force. And so, the, so it was key in their sense of justice in the supplantation of the ordeal that a human accuser had to come forward to make an accusation. But this begins to change at the end of the 12th century when a new type of procedure was introduced cause, uh, called the inquisitorial procedure. And the inquisitorial procedure was very much like the procedure that we see in European courts today and in South America, Central America, in civil law jurisdictions. The judge conducts an investigation. He conducts an investigation because he is notified in one way or another that a crime has been committed. And because there has been a crime, the jurist concocted a legal principle, which I have up on the screen. It is in the interests of the public good that crimes should not remain unpub unpunished. Publica utilitatis interset ne crimine remaniant impunita. This becomes a very, very important principle of European criminal law at the end of the 12th and the beginning of the 13th century. Now, there was a fair amount 
of opposition to this new inquisitorial procedure. And I must say in brackets, this inquisitorial procedure has nothing to do with heresy, burning people at the stake. This is just a different way of thinking about how crimes should be published, uh, should be punished. It has nothing to do with the Inquisition in capital letters and the punishment of heretics. <clears throat> but it is using inquisitorial procedure that seems to be linked to the reintroduction of the Roman law of torture into European jurisprudence. Now, we're not absolutely clear how that worked or when it happened. But it's clear that during the 13th century that gradually Roman rules of torture were introduced. And they were not introduced into the accusatorial procedure, which continued to exist cheek by jowl with the inquisitorial procedure, but it existed in the inquisitorial procedure. That is to say, what we would call the government or the state, when it began to investigate criminal offenses, that's when they began to use torture. Now, I've covered a lot of ground. I hope I've been semi-lucid. But what I would like to do now is to look at a couple of cases, three cases, three actual cases, but also to look at a proceduralist to help you to put how torture was used in European courts in the period roughly between 1300 and 1700. And the first case that we're going to look at is a case from Bologna. Bologna, as you remember, is the place where the revival of law took place, the end of the 11th, the beginning of the 12th century. And the Bolognese archives are rich with cases of prosecutions. And the reason for that is that at the beginning of the 13th century, it was also ordained that in criminal cases that there had to be very thorough documentation, which is great for the legal historian. All the testimony had to be recorded. The court um, proceedings had to be recorded. Everything that happened in a particular case had to be recorded. And what that means is, particularly in the Italian archives, but this practice spread to the northern archives as well, we have really, really rich documentation on exactly how court cases were heard. The case that I've uh, chosen to illustrate is uh, the case of Mengo. Mengo was a, we're not clear whether he was a citizen of Bologna, and this is particularly important because the statutes of the city of Bologna by this time dictated that citizens of Bologna could not be tortured unless there was very, very grave reason for their being tortured. But in any case, Vecto, employing the inquisitorial procedure, Vecto was a criminal judge in Bologna. He had been appointed by the Podesta, who was the chief magistrate in the city of Bologna. And the Podesta is a title that was given to every chief magistrate within the Italian city-states. Vecto was given the obligation to conduct an investigation of Mango, who had been accused of stealing silk. I might add now that uh, I would like you to pay a little bit of attention to the, uh, the art that I've put up on the web, because it's not, just, uh, it's not just random art that I've put up. It is connected with what we're going to be talking about just a little bit later on. 
I've selected a number of paintings from Caravaggio. Caravaggio is a uh, early 17th, late 16th, early 17th century artist who probably knew more about criminal procedure than anyone in this room. Certainly he knew more about criminal procedure than I do because he was he was brought before criminal courts time and time again for basically violent, homicidal, irrational, and uh, uh, bloody activities, both in Rome, in Sicily, in Naples. He got into trouble again and again and again. And I think as you look at uh, some of these paintings, this one, Ecce Homo, uh, as you look at these paintings, I think you see some great sympathy that Caravaggio had for the, uh, for the persecuted. Vecto ordered a miles, that is to say a knight whose name was Lozario, to conduct an investigation. And what Lozario did was to interview nine different witnesses. Some of the witnesses told Lozario that Mengo was all right. Other witnesses, according to the uh, documents in the archives, concluded that uh, Mengo, they didn't know about Mengo. They had never heard about Mengo. And other witnesses thought that that Mango was guilty. Now, according to the rules of criminal procedure that were being developed at this time, this was very inconclusive. This was not sufficient proof to, to bring about a conviction of Mango in Vecto's court. However, Lozario was a, an efficient investigator. We would call him a PI today. He went to Mango's house. I'm not sure that uh, Mango was the brightest thief in Bologna and found four skeins of silk. The four skeins of silk were identified as being the four skeins of silk that had been, uh, that had been stolen. And Vecto then decided that uh, there was now substantial, and the technical term was sufficient presumption. There was pre sufficient presumption since the skeins of silk had been discovered in Mango's house that, um, that Mango might be guilty of this crime. Mango was brought to court. And this was a very important part of the process. The, the case that I'm describing to you was all in Latin. And what would happen is that Mango, when he was, when he was questioned, and the witnesses, when they were questioned, their responses would be written down in Latin. But then in court, as you notice, in order for Mango to understand what was going on, it was translated into Mango's Italian, obviously. Mango was not a university graduate. He wasn't a Dartmouth graduate at any rate. And um, as you can see, Mango denies everything. Now, and this is a key point. At this point, because there was a sufficient presumption of guilt, Vecto decided that Mango should be tortured. What the records do not tell us, and I would love to know it, they don't tell us this for another oh, century, century and a half. They don't tell us how he was tortured. We're going to get into the different types of torture in just a minute. But they don't tell us how he was tortured. All they say is that he was tortured. And you also notice. And this is part of the Bolognese statutes. You also notice that four magistrates have to be present at the place where Mango was tortured, and that there had to be a notary to write down both the questions as well as the answers. 
that Mengo gave while he was being tortured. And as you can see, he admitted to his guilt. He admitted to not only stealing the silk, but also under torture, he admitted other crimes. And then he was brought back to court. And Vecto, the judge, then questioned him again. And it was a key part of the process that Mengo had to repeat his confession, exactly the same confession that he made under torture. If he did not repeat that confession exactly, the confession was not valid. If he denied it, it was not valid. And we'll see in a minute that if he denied confessing, or if he, excuse me, if he denied the truth of what he had confessed under torture, then he could be tortured one more time. But not anymore. And in this case, part of the rationale is that either the presumption of guilt was strong enough that he could be convicted without torture, or the case was not strong enough, and then he should be exonified. Exonerated, I should say. Well, poor Mango. Uh, Bologna in the 13th century was a uh, mecca for capital punishment. And as you can see, that after he had confirmed his confession in the courtroom, that uh, Mango was then um, condemned and he was hanged. The uh, picture that I've been showing you of Caravaggio is a picture that's going to come up later. It's a picture of the de beheading of Holofernes by Judith. Judith is one of the great heroines of the Old Testament. And uh, she saved Israel by, um, well, the Old Testament is not exactly clear what exactly she did in Holofernes' tent that night, but she got him rip-roaring drunk, and then she cut off his head. And what Caravaggio, what this painting is illustrating is the decapitation of Holofernes. Uh, I want you to just notice that in the biblical account that uh, Judith, this is Judith, and uh, this is her servant. In the biblical account, Judith sent the servant out of the room. Caravaggio was enormously inventive in the way in which he represented scenes out of both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that um, the maid servant, as well as uh, Judith, seems extraordinarily intent and in the act of decapitating Holofernes. To fast forward <coughs> 200 years, Prospero Farinacci was the most important criminal proceduralist at the end of the 15th and the beginning of the 16th century. This is a wonderful painting by Cesare of uh, Farinace, which hangs in the Castel Sant'Angelo in Rome. It's particularly interesting because uh, Farinace's, you'll notice that Cesare has covered one of his eyes. Well, um, Farinace lost his left eye because uh, he got into a a, it wasn't a duel, it was just a fight. And in losing the eye, he also was involved in a court case of being a criminal proceduralist. He was not only, he was not only interested in describing criminal procedure, but he also had some experience in the criminal courts of Rome. Uh, the, most, uh, the most interesting case that he was involved in was that he was accused of sodomy of a young male servant of the cardinal uh, Marco Sitico Altans, 
and uh, his name was uh, Bernardino Rocchi. Uh, he was accused of sodomizing the young boy. He was uh, convicted of the accusation, and it was only through the intercession of the Pope that he was, uh, that he was later forgiven for this particular misstep. Um, pope Clement VIII, the pope that uh, absolved him of the, of the crime, is said to have remarked, uh, la farina è buona, e il sacco che è cattivo, which translates into English, uh, the flower, that's a pun on Farinace's name, the flower is, is good, but the sack is, uh, is bad. In any case, um, Farinacci wrote the most extensive description of the criminal law, the criminal jurisprudence of torture that we have. And he drew upon approximately three centuries of thinking about torture in European courts. And I'm just going to go through some of the major issues that Farinacci dealt with. Before one tortures, there had to be legitimate, probable, grave, and sufficient evidence. The judge has to be almost certain of guilt. The prince, what we would call the government, the government could not order anyone to be tortured without those sufficient proofs, without that sufficient presumption. And if the government did, or if I should say, if the government did order someone to be tortured and the judge did it, the judge was criminally liable. If a judge threatens someone with torture, that is torture. If someone is ordered to be tortured, the judge has to set a certain time limit in which the person who is to be tortured can present evidence that he is not guilty of the crime for which he is tortured. And if the judge ignores that time limit, the confession is not valid, and in fact the whole proceedings is not valid. There were a large number of people who were exempt from torture. The most obvious people were uh, pregnant women, the nobility, and minors. If judges have sufficient proof to permit torture, they must issue a decree in which the defendant to be tortured is given all the evidence against the person. Someone cannot be tortured. There cannot be a presumption of guilt unless all the evidence is presented to the person who is going to be tortured. And then, as I said before, a defendant, if he does not confess in open court without being under the coercion of being tortured, then he can only be confess, uh, he can only be tortured one more time. And finally, witnesses can only be tortured if they vacillate, but if they are tortured, if a judge decides that a witness has given vacillating evidence, then they can only be tortured under the same rules and regulations as a defendant. Farinacci goes on to talk about the various grades of torture. By the way, uh, Farinacci's book is a large folio volume. It consists of about 800 pages in very small type. And the part de devoted to torture is about 300 pages long of two columns of very small type. So what I'm giving you is a very rapid survey. It's a summary of what the common opinion was about torture at the beginning of the 17th century. The five grades of torture are first taking the person to where the torture was to be committed. That was torture. The second grade was a defendant is taken to the place where torture is committed. 
is bound up to the torture machine. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But he is not tortured. That's the second grade of torture. There's no physical pain involved. The third grade of torture is that he is bound up and then he is raised, and this is <laughs> uh, rather <laughs> interesting or paradoxical, they would, they would decide that the torture would last for the length of an Ave Maria, that is, or a Pater Noster, an Our Father, or a Credo, or one of the prayers connected with the Christian liturgy. There were strict limits about how long a person could be tortured. A person could be tortured the length of a prayer, but then the torture could only be repeated for a certain length of time. In the case of the, of the fourth uh, grade of torture, it could only last for three quarters of an hour. It could not last for any longer. And remember that there had to be magistrates present and there had to be a notary present and as we'll see, there also had to be the judge present as well. And then finally, the worst grade of torture was when the defendant was weighted, his uh, feet were weighted, and uh, this most severe grade of, port of torture was reserved for really serious, heinous crimes. Now, the most common types of torture were the uh, tormentum sibilorum, or the sibyl, as it was caused. This was done by wrapping strings around a person's fingers, attaching them to a handle, and then twisting the strings, applying pressure to the fingers, not so that it would cut the skin, but just simply to inflict pain on the person. The second grade of torture, and Farnacci tells us that this is the most common form of torture, is the one that we have pictured here. I uh, tried to get a, um, a picture of the Sibylorum, and there's a wonderful example of the Sibylorum in a movie that some of you may have seen. That if you saw the movie about Artemisia Gentileschi, in that movie they show a very authentic Sibylorum uh, as part of that movie, authentic to the extent that uh, the torture was exactly, the Sibylorum is exactly the way it was performed. It wasn't authentic in that the actress then had blood streaming down her fingers, which uh, wasn't part of the Sibylorum. But the most common form of torture, as Farnanacci says, is the so-called corda. And here you have it pictured. There would be a, a crane of sorts. And this, we have art historical evidence that this dates back to at least the middle of the 13th century. There would be a crane. The person's arms would be bound behind him. And then, as you can see from the picture, the person would be raised, be raised for an Ave Maria or for a Pater Noster, and then the person would be lowered, and then perhaps raised again, and then lowered. And if the torture was to make, be made particularly severe, cold water would be poured down the person's back. Now, I don't have any experience with this. I don't think any of you have any experience with this. It, I can't quite imagine why cold water would make this torture particularly um, painful, but this is what Farnacci, who had a lot of experience torturing people, uh, this is what Farnacci tells us. And then finally, a torture that uh, we're all familiar with. We've all read about it in the newspaper. Um, the torture, or the so-called torture, of keeping people awake for a long period of time dates well back into the early modern and medieval period. And Farinacci describes this as being the absolute worst torture that anyone could undergo. And as he points out, particularly when combined with the corda, which raised the person up and extended the person, that this particular person uh, 
um, in 95% of the time, the person who was being tortured and his choice of words here are very illustrative. They turned into confessors. <laughs> and in only 5% of the time, these people became martyrs. Only 5% of the people could withstand this kind of torture. I mentioned the film of uh, Artemisa Gentileschi. For those of you who have an interest in art history, um, Artemisia has been the hot commodity in the art historical market over the past uh, 15 or 20 years. There have been major exhibitions of her work in Rome, in New York. Uh, and right now, this particular painting, which my wife and I saw in Rome uh, about seven years ago, uh, this particular painting um, is in Washington, D.C. at an exhibition of Italian artists. So I invite you to all come down to Washington, D.C. to see Artemisia's uh, uh, painting. You can see it's exactly the same theme as Caravaggio's um, painting that I was talking about just a moment ago. It is the decapitation of Holofernes by um, By Judith, I would just note two further things that were also typical of, uh, or a part of, the way in which Caravaggio imagined it. In the Bible, Holofernes is lying next to the table. He's become drunk, and the servant woman is out. Here he's pictured, both here and in Caravaggio, he's pictured in bed. And he's pictured in bed naked. Now, what this had to do with poor Judith and what Judith had to do before she cut off his head is problematic from a biblical point of view. But um, you'll notice that the bed is soaked with Holofernes' blood, even much more soaked with Holofernes' blood than uh, the picture of Caravaggio. This may seem extraneous information, but we're going to get back to this in, in just a moment. The reason that um, I picked out Artemisia is that Artemisia has become famous because she's one of the best and one of the first, not the first, but one of the best, really first-rate female artists in the European tradition. And this is one of her best paintings. But she also has become famous, if not in uh, the general public, but in scholarly circles, because of a court case. And the court case involved her father, Orazio Gentileschi, who was a painter as well, not a great painter, not as good as uh, his daughter, Artemisia, but uh, a decent painter. And <coughs> Orazio accused a friend of his Augustino Tassi of raping Artemisia. And he brought this case to court. And Augustino responded in court that he didn't rape his daughter, even though it was proven by examination. In other words, uh, this was another inquisitorial procedure. It was proven that Artemisia was no longer a virgin and that she had had sexual intercourse with someone. And so this case dragged on for a very long time. It dragged on for nine months. And it was a typical rape case. It was he said, she said. And finally, because there wasn't sufficient evidence, and I emphasize this, the presumption of guilt was not sufficient enough, neither party could be tortured. The judge in this case, and we have, as we had in the Mengo case, we have complete documentation of this case. In this particular case, no one could be tortured because there wasn't sufficient proof one way or the other. But finally, Artemisia submitted to being tortured. And the reason she submitted to being tortured 
was to prove her case. The witness, in this case, the plaintiff, well, he, she's really not the plaintiff. Her father was the plaintiff in the case. But she wanted to prove the truthfulness of her accusation against Augustino. And she submitted to the torture of the sibilorum, that is, the strings around the fingers. She endured the torture. That is to say, she stuck to her testimony. She made her testimony before the judge. And in fact, Augustino Tassi was then convicted of the rape of Artemisia. And the story did not end particularly well because um, Artemisia then married a nobody. She was, in a sense, from a point of view of Italian customs of the uh, early 17th century. She was damaged goods, and so she finally married someone that was not a particularly good match. Augustino, by the way, uh, she would have married gladly, but um, Augustino had one great drawback. He was married already. The last case that I wanted to talk about to illustrate torture is probably the most famous case of the entire early modern period. And it's a, it's a wonderful story. And I'll tell it in just a little bit of detail. A very bad name, his, a man, his name was Francesco Cenci, was murdered. He was murdered in a castle that he owned in Petrella Salto, which is in the Apennines, in the central part of Italy. And the ruins of this castle today, uh, this is an old photograph which gives you some sense of how isolated this castle was. Uh, it looks like a nice place to have a picnic today. But uh, back in the 16th century, it was a very isolated castle in a very primitive part of the Italian peninsula. And Francesco Cenci, who was one of the greatest landowners in the city of Rome, particularly in the old Jewish ghetto part of the city of Rome, if any of you are familiar with the topography of Rome, Francesco Cenci had sent his wife, Beatrice Cenci's mother, and Beatrice to the Rocco Cenci in exile. And he kept them under more or less house arrest. Uh, Cenci had a terrible reputation. He had been called, hauled before criminal courts a number of times. He had been accused of a number of different kinds of crimes. He had been accused of rape. He had been accused of sodomy. He, uh, had a reputation in Rome that was absolutely abysmal. And evidently, he also abused his daughter and his wife as well. There was even one accusation that uh, Cenci, Francesco Cenci had tried to rape Beatrice. And there was a confirmed accusation that Francesco, when he would come out to the Rocca Cenci, that he would rape his wife in front of Beatrice. So it's a really sordid, crummy, disgusting story about a really disgusting human being, Francesco Cenci. Well, the upshot of it is that <coughs> evidently Beatrice was desperate. And she enlisted. Olimpio Calvetti, who unfortunately was married, but evidently uh, Beatrice found him attractive, and also a local peasant, Marzio Catalano, and she enlisted them to murder her father. And on the evening of the 9th of December, 
according to the court records, Marzio, Olimpio, Beatrice, and it's not clear exactly who else went into Francesco's bedroom after drugging him and beat him with cudgels until he was dead. And then they threw him out the window. If you remember, the castle still has a window. They threw him out the window so it would look as if he had tottered off his balcony and fell down a very steep cliff which was next to the window. <coughs> this case was heard in Roman court. The Cenci were Roman nobility. And so you remember the rules of Farinacci, they could not be tortured. But finally, the same pope who had a hand in the affair of uh, Farinacci, Clement VIII, issued a document on the 5th of August, 1599, that uh, permitted the torture of Lucrezia, Beatrice, and two of Beatrice's brother who were thought to be involved in the parricide, Giacomo and Bernardo. <clears throat> As part of the story, Marzio, the peasant, was brought down to the torture chamber. You remember the various grades of torture, was brought down to the torture chamber and was threatened with torture. And he confessed immediately. He confessed that he was part of it, but this was not sufficient proof to condemn Beatrice and her brothers. And so with the papal permission, Beatrice and Giacomo were both tortured. Giacomo was tortured with the corda. He confesses in the first session. And Lucrezia is tortured with the corda. She confesses. Her confession was essentially, they did it. <laughs> and then Beatrice is also tortured. And she, as she's raised up for an Ave Maria, she says, Oime, oime, oh Madonna Santissima, aiutame. Um, oh, blessed virgin, please help me and let me down. <laughs> Let me down, I will tell you the truth. And finally, at that point, after a trial which had lasted now for almost a year, she confesses, she repeats her confession, and all the others confess, uh, repeat their confession in front of the judge. And then the trial could take place. The evidence had been gathered. And now the trial could take place. Place. And her lawyer, this painting, which is a 19th century painting by a completely irrelevant and unknown artist, but it's particularly interesting because, as you'll notice, the, the image of Beatrice was burned into the Roman consciousness. And even in the 19th century, um, this artist recreates that picture of Rainey that I showed you just a moment ago. But what is particularly interesting as well is the, uh, the figure of Beatrice's lawyer who came into prison to prepare her defense in the court case. And you recognize him? Farinacci. If you would go back to look at the portrait of Farinacci, that's Farinacci. <laughs> Farinacci took up the defense. He was a Johnny, the criminal equivalent of Johnny Cochran in the uh, beginning of the seventh, uh, 17th century, or the end of the 16th century, I should say, in this case. Farinacci took up his, uh, the defense of Beatrice. Unfortunately, there was nothing that uh, Farinacci could do because he could not prove the technical term was stuprum, 
which you really can't translate into English. It's just the disgustingly bad behavior of Francesco Cenci that I described to you before. Farinacci could not prove the stuprum, and one of the reasons he couldn't prove it is that Francesco Cenci was dead. And in the most dramatic part of the story, Beatrice, Lucrezia, her mother, Giacomo were led through the city of Rome in carts, taken to the Castel Sant'Angelo. And again, if you know Rome, that, um, that um, bridge right in front of the Castel Sant'Angelo, there was an execution platform that was built and Lucrezia was beheaded. Beatrice was beheaded. Giacomo was beheaded. And the younger brother, Bernardo, who was only 14 or 15 years old, was sent to the galleys. At just a small change of pace. If you look now at these paintings again, this is Caravaggio's. This is Art Artemisia Gentileschi's version of the beheading of Holofernes. Art historians have concluded that in the case of Caravaggio, he painted this in 1599, the exact year that Beatrice and her mother and her brother were beheaded in front of the Castel Sant'Angelo, they have concluded that it was the beheading of Beatrice and her mother and her brother that inspired Caravaggio to paint this painting. And art historians absolutely bedazzled by the rape of Artemisia have argued that in the case of the Judith decapitating Holofernes, that this is actually Augustino Tassi, the person who raped Artemisia, who was on the bed, and that what Artemisia is doing is exacting pictorial vengeance on Augustino. There are a couple of problems with that interpretation. I think one of the major problems is that it's the story of the murder of Francesco Cenci. If you think about the man lying naked in his bed, being murdered in his bed, it is that story which becomes the most important and the most famous criminal case, not just in the early or our late 16th, the beginning of the 17th century, but it remains a famous case right up until the present day. There have been seven Italian films which have been made about the story of Beatrice Cenci. This story was such a part of the Roman imagination that I just can't believe that this has anything to do with the beheading of Beatrice, but I think both paintings are primarily concerned with the murder of Francesco Cenci. You don't have to believe that. I'm not an art historian, but I think that uh, the connection between the Cenci case is, uh, at least in my mind, fairly persuasive. You probably all know that, uh, um, many of you know, <laughs> that <coughs> Cesare Beccaria in the mid 18th century wrote a very famous book, De Delite Della Pena, in which he argued vehemently against torture and against capital punishment. And it's during the course of the 18th century that torture was not capital punishment, but torture was abandoned in most European courtrooms. By the end of the 18th century, there were very few courts that were still torturing people. But this movement to abolish torture began very much earlier, 
the first person that I know of who made an argument in the European context about torture, this is after St. Augustine and after the, the Roman world, is a man in 1522, one Louis Vives, makes a very trenchant argument based in large part about on the argument of St. Augustine. And then I've listed a number of other pre-Cesare Beccaria writers who argued against torture in the 16th and 17th centuries. Alessandro Mazzoni, who's perhaps the most famous Italian novelist, sums up this entire story that I've been telling you by pointing out that it was about three or four or possibly five centuries of juristic thinking about the justice of torture which finally led European courts to abandon the practice of torture, that is, sanction torture by governments, by courts, and by judges. And that leads us back to the present. I think there's no doubt that given the definitions of torture that I have just been outlining for you and three or four centuries of European jurisprudence, there's absolutely no doubt that by any definition that what we have been doing in the United States of America has been torturing people. And one of the questions that is raised by this and that our government has raised, and I'm using John Yu as an example, who was one of the drafters of that memo in the Justice Department back in 2002, is some of the wording in the Geneva Convention as recently as uh, September of 2006, President Bush essentially repeats the same arguments that John Yu made back in 2002 in which he says that the Geneva Conventions are so vague. What's torture after all? How can you define torture? Well, I think Dilawar, this Afghan, probably could define torture for them very well indeed. Uh, one of the results of our practice, uh, both in Guantanamo and further afield, of torturing people has been not just in the inflicting of pain and suffering on people, but also we have been killing people by torturing them. And one of the questions that has to be asked, and this is where I must confess I don't have the answers, but I'll give you some suggestions that perhaps we can talk about. Why? Why have we begun to employ torture after two and a half centuries? And why do we think that torture is effective? Well, I'd give you three reasons. The first reason is that the people who are employing torture have never experienced torture. And they didn't know the jurisprudence of torture. Someone like uh, Prospero Farinacci knew torture very well. He knew the limits of torture. Those judges and jurists back then had a great deal of experience with torture. They studied torture in law school. Nobody studies torture in law school today. And they had some idea about the efficacy of torture, something that I would argue we simply don't have today. The second point that I would make is that, and it's connected with the first point, is that we don't have the practical experience. None of us have ever seen torture. 
None of us will probably ever experience torture, and I think it's only through the experience of torture that we can really understand torture. And it's also by thinking about torture, as Farinacci and many, I mean hundreds of jurists before the abolition of torture thought very carefully about how torture ought to be employed, what was torture, what was not torture. The third point that I would make about why we are in the situation that we are in today, and I'm going to sound like John Bolton now, blame the UN <laughs> and blame the Geneva Conventions. If you think about what I've outlined about the jurisprudence of torture in prior centuries, when they really did know about torture, the part of the Geneva Convention that is very odd, in which both John Yu and President Bush and many others who have defended torture have gravitated and discussed, is Section C in the Geneva Conventions, outrages upon personal dignity, in particular humiliating and degrading treatment. Think about that. What does that mean? Even the mildest form of torture is not degrading and humiliating to the personal dignity of another human being. Farinacci and the rest of the jurists who really knew about torture would have been absolutely flummoxed by this element that is put into the Geneva Conventions. It's sufficient to say the following acts are and shall remain prohibited at any time and in any place. And at the end of it is torture. And if you know what torture is, you don't have to add that it's denigrating with outrages upon personal dignity or that it's humiliating. And an even worse example of this and the last example of this that I will give you is the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel and Inhuman or Degrading Treatment or Punishment that was a UN document and in this UN document, torture is defined as any act by which severe pain and suffering is inflicted on a person, whether physical or mental. Farinacci, again, would just throw up his hands. And any jurist in the age of torture would have said, this is nonsense. Torture is not just severe pain. And of course, our government has latched on to this particular phrase, <laughs> severe pain, and has tried to define what severe pain is. And if you define torture as severe pain, as it is defined in this UN document, which we are signatories to this particular convention, if you, if you define it as severe pain, then something less than severe pain is justified. Thank you very much. Thank you.
I just wanted to understand your argument uh, at the end here. Um, are you saying that uh, torture has a self-evident meaning given the historical background and consequently it is not necessary to elaborate its scope in other language which would then lead to a whole series of interpretations of one sort or another? I'm saying something very similar to that. Um, I'm saying that if you know the history of the jurisprudence covering torture, that, and if you accept that jurisprudence, if you think that the jurisprudence of Farinacci and many others, I'm just using Farinacci as my exemplum, but if you accept their arguments about torture and their understanding of torture, and in many ways, remember this dates back to the Roman period. The Roman jurists had the same understanding that in the Geneva Conventions, for example, the idea that, or in the Convention on Inhuman Treatment, that it's not that torture doesn't have to be defined. It certainly does have to be defined. And Farinacci, uh, in my summary, you don't necessarily get the full flavor of the detail of Farinacci's discussion of torture, but he goes on and on and on describing in minute detail the what, what defines torture, what is torture, how it should be used, what is not torture. And if you accept that jurisprudential thought, then in the Geneva Conventions, if we all understood that in the same way and we all accepted it in the same way, it isn't necessary to define torture. And in fact, I would even say that it's wrong to define torture as the infliction of severe pain. That's the only definition of torture, I would say. Um, I agree with the tradition that it is, uh, torture is far more than just the infliction of severe mental pain. Oh, okay. I guess what I'm asking is, are we in a situation now where there is not an underlying practice or custom that can provide the sets of meanings uh, for the laws? And as a consequence, what happens is you lay out a rule on torture, but it can't contain the uh, ongoing practices at this particular time. And so you, Y-O-O, -O, you <laughs> or other people uh, are forced to turn to definitional uh, stratagems because there is no background practice, social practice, exactly. to give meaning to the term. Is that, that's the thrust? That, that's exactly right. We, do, we don't have we don't have people think, we haven't had people thinking seriously about torture for 250 years. If you read any, any I mean, in law schools, law professors, uh, et cetera. Anyway, I. <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering what uh, um, you're doing with status because implicit in your discussion of the Roman material is a, uh, a, a status divide that is um, not being discussed. Uh, you torture people who aren't citizens and aren't free because they're not people of honor in Rome. And therefore, as people incapable of honor, you have to use torture to get, to get material out of them. And that status divide is implicit, I think, in the Roman law of torture. And I don't know what happens in the medieval period, but as I look at Article I of the UN, what I see is an extension, finally, of the notion of a person of honor being somebody, uh, regardless of class, regardless of status, regardless of nationality. And so it's not an assert, I, I, I don't, I don't claim to be 
a uh, modern uh, lawyer, but what strikes me is that the status divide has been erased in, in, the, in these UN definitions. And I'm wondering what happens in the medieval period when the Roman law of torture is reprised by medieval thinkers, do they argue around the status distinctions, or do they ignore them? No, status is very important. And in the case of Beatrice, uh, it took the pope to remove that uh, impediment of torturing nobles. Remember? But is there a conflict in Roman period? Seneca says you use whips and, and violence against somebody because they are incapable of education, they are incapable of honor. And so these physical torments are appropriate to someone who is incapable of honor. And I'm, I guess what I'm asking is, does the medieval literature show awareness of that discourse? No, not, not in this, not the same Roman sense of honor. The R Romans had an extraordinarily exalted, as you obviously no uh, uh, a sense of honor. And that does not come through. They think about it in terms of legal status. And legal status is citizen, non-citizen, uh, slave or, or free or, or not free, noble or, or not noble. Uh, that's the categories that they think in terms of. It, it seems to me for the current situation that the question of law is simply irrelevant. This administration, uh, and particularly the vice president, have violated laws from the very beginning. For example, right at the beginning, a, a formal uh, letter addressed personally from the Crown Prince Abdullah of Saudi Arabia to President Bush was intercepted by the vice president and never delivered to the president. We see again and again violations of a law of all sorts, and the fact that uh, this administration believes that if you are involved in the war on terror, unindicted enemy conspiracies, rendition, there's an invention of a jurisprudence, uh, the, uh, uh, the undivided uh, uh, executive, uh, unilateral action. Uh, wherever we look, we are at a very critical time because the notion of law is no longer respected by the administration. And I think, uh, uh, one other example, for example, is the ban on uh, embryonic stem cell research, uh, which is based on what is really a religious doctrine, violating the First Amendment, and imposed it's the president's own personal religious doctrine. And people have not looked at the Constitution as something that we've got to pay attention to because we're in real trouble. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I guess I'm a little bit piggybacking on that. Uh, my prejudice is that there has been, with you and Gonzalez, uh, Bush and Cheney have simply been handed whatever interpretations they want to have. So I realize it's tricky trying to project into the future, but what I'm wondering is would you imagine that hopefully in the near future, these people will simply be recognized as incompetence, and therefore what they have done hopefully will be swept aside? Or have they really established serious precedent that is going to take a huge amount of work and judicial interpretation in order to overturn, pardon me, but the poison that they have sown? Well, I think it's up to those of us. Um, I'm writing a law review article right now, which is basically a great expansion of the text that I've presented to you today. And I, I hope when it's published that uh, the courts and other people will pay attention to it. Uh, Jeremy Waldron's article that I uh, pointed out earlier is not a history of torture, but it is a, dis a very, very thorough discussion from a modern point of view, pur purely a modern point of view, of both the efficacy uh, of torture as well as the legal justification of torture. As I told you in the beginning of the lecture, a lecture he's, uh, he's uh, adamantly opposed to torture, and he puts forward, using just American law, uh, 
he puts forward very sound, uh, for me anyway, uh, very sound arguments for the abolition of any kind of torture by Americans of anybody, not just citizens, but non-citizens. She's left now, but remember that uh, it's the other that very often suffers in our judicial system. Um, if you go back to, uh, well, to ex parte Kieran, where the five German saboteurs were summarily executed even though they had not committed sabotage, or you go to uh, Korematsu, the a nefarious case in which we um, incarcerated several hundred thousand uh, Japanese Americans during World War II, or if you go to the case in Rei Yamashita, where uh, one of the most egregious uh, violations of due process in, in the execution of a German general in a trial that lasted about three weeks at the end of World War II, I mean, the list can go on and on and on. And I'm choosing these because they were sanctioned. It's not torture exactly, but it, um, it, these were cases which were sanctioned by p proper public authority. Um, in the case of uh, Yamashita, one of the most one of the most passionate one of the most passionate moving peons to due process that I have ever read is by the dissent of. Justice Rutledge in that particular case in, in calling for due process for every single human being. Um, and what we do is, as, as she indicated, I, or was trying to indicate, uh, we, we demonize the enemy. And this is what has happened since 9-11. We have been demonizing um, these Hamas uh, Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and because they're demons, because they're devils, um, we can do what we want to them is essentially. Uh, We're going to take the last two short questions right here. Yeah, uh, sure. As I recall uh, some of Langbein's uh, scholarship on torture, uh, he suggested there was a considerable deterioration over the time, um, and that the safeguards that had surrounded torture during its earlier and higher period, more protected period, had eroded by uh, late into the torture period. And, and I think, I, I gathered that he thought that that was uh, a large part of the reason for the, uh, the ultimate um, abolition of, of torture. Uh, was that the safeguards had been lost. Uh, your emphasis of sort of the high period of torture when the safeguards were more in place uh, suggests a little different reading of that abolition. And I just uh, wondered if you could comment on what I took to be Langbein's thesis and, and a little bit of tension with the way you present it. Right, and there, there is tension, and uh, part of it if I knew how to <laughs> reverse this, I would go back to uh, uh, one of the pages in which I cited a book, a recent book by Lisa Silverman. On uh, Lisa Silverman studied torture in cases in Toulouse in the 16th and 17th centuries, and what she did is went through. She went through several hundred cases in the archives of Toulouse with the same kind of documentation that exists in the Roman cases that I, uh, and Bologna cases. And her results were absolutely startling. Now I showed you um, the well-documented intellectual reaction against torture that begins in the early 16th century with Vives. What Silverman discovered is that there was a decline of the use of torture in the 16th and 17th and early 18th centuries in the courts of Toulouse. This is absolutely startling. I know of no other legal historian who has done that kind of work uh, because no other legal historian has done that kind of work. 
It's enormously laborious work, and I ain't going to do it. <laughs> but if you can extrapolate from Silverman's evidence, then Langbein is quite wrong. That not only was there a, I mean, not wrong, I should nuance that, but that there was not only an intellectual, theoretical reaction against the use of torture in the courts, but judges began to use torture much less during, from the high use of torture, as you described it, through the abolition of torture in the 18th century than we imagined. But um, I'm not saying that Silverman is right. I'm just, or that you can extrapolate to the yard, larger European context, but it's very, very evocative um, evidence. And, and does her work show that the safeguards did not erode as, as he suggests, as well as the yes. she went down? Yes, yes. The frequency of torture declines as well as, uh, but, but the, uh, the rules about torture did not. That is not to say that torture was not misused. If I wanted to give you a lecture on the misuse of torture between the 13th and 18th century, there's lots of information. Um, you know, we may or may not be, uh, I think we are misusing torture today, but uh, there's lots of evidence that was misused in the past as well. Um, I guess I approach it a little differently, but you, you said at one point, I think, at the end that uh, uh, the president had advocated or defended the use of torture, and I'm not aware that that's true. I, I, it seems to me that he's made repeatedly, whether he has a different idea of what torture is from what other people do, but he's repeatedly said that he's against it, the torture and that we don't use torture. But I have other <coughs> another point or two to make. One can I just, sure. can I just, <coughs> you're, you're absolutely right. And both the vice president and the president have described what Farinacci would call torture as abuse. That's the language. So it's a definitional thing. Yeah. Um, I, I believe uh, that the courts have determined that the uh, detainees in Guantanamo are covered by Geneva. But there, there it seems to me there are still arguments to be made that they're not. They, they didn't wear uniforms, at least, mo in fact, none of them as far as I know, and that uh, certain, they didn't meet certain provisions of Geneva, so I'm, I'm wondering why uh, they're, if they really uh, deserve the same kind of uh, protection that is accorded others under Geneva. And I have one other question. You, you describe yourself at the beginning as an absolutist against torture, and I, uh, I mean, there's the, uh, the, 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 the usual case, and I think Dershowitz <laughs> gets to that, that, where you've got somebody that you have every reason to believe knows where a nuclear weapon is hidden and about to go off, kill it, which would kill tens or hundreds of thousands, uh, that um, he advocates that you have a system where you'd have to get a court order to permit torture, I believe. But would you still, in a situation like that, if you can paint that kind of an absolute picture, would you still say, better to let the bomb go off than to torture somebody in whom you think might be convinced to tell you where it is? Well, um, do you watch Jack Bauer in 24? Yeah. <laughs> Very <o'clock> tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jack Bauer is enormously successful in that particular scenario, isn't he? Um, I'm not sure that that, I mean, I would still say yes, no torture. But that scenario is never going to happen. It happens in 24, but it doesn't happen in real life and probably wouldn't happen in real life. And, and to, be, to be absolutely uh, cynical about it, if it would happen and there was a Jack Bauer on the scene, he's going to torture the person and maybe he will get the information or maybe he won't, but it won't be under a court order as uh, Alan Dershowitz would have it. Uh, it would just be rogue torture, uh, right? No, no, uh, but, but no, I'm, I would still say I'm an absolutist when it comes to not torturing another human being, another human being. And if I knew how to go back to the Geneva Conventions, if you reread the first paragraph of the Geneva Conventions, which talks about the people who are covered by Article 3, 
it doesn't exclude anyone. It really doesn't exclude any human being. It says anyone who has been captured by troops, by, in this case, American troops, who has laid down their weapons and is no longer fighting until they're, while they're still fighting, of course, you can shoot them. But they've laid down their troops, and it doesn't just say people in uniform. It talks about civilians. It talks about anyone who is no longer fighting and has been taken captive by, in America, and since we're talking about the United States of America, by Americans, that they are covered by that Geneva Convention. So I think this distinction that the administration has conjured up, it's not just the administration, it's also the Justice Department making a distinction between enemy combatants. By the way, I did a, a Westlaw search on enemy combatants. It's first used in a Supreme Court decision back in the 50s, and it was used completely differently from the way in which um, it's used in the present political discourse. So um, uh, it's just not a, a valid category, I would say. To, to distinguish. We're talking about human beings. This is my main argument. We're talking about human beings. And I don't care whether you're an Arab or, or um, well, whatever. <laughs> I wouldn't want to torture you, no matter how bad I thought you were. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Ken. Okay.